Hello, my name is Deborah Bromage, and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. Welcome to NKF Kidney Talks. For this edition, I will be talking about dietary management of hyperkalemia in patients with chronic kidney disease. There are many etiologies for acute and chronic hyperkalemia, but they basically fall into two categories. One is an excess of potassium released from cells, and the second is acute intake of potassium. This program will focus on dietary intake of potassium. Let's begin with a study that looked at dietary potassium intake and mortality in hemodialysis patients. In this study, food frequency questionnaires were used to determine the potassium intake of 224 patients on hemodialysis. After adjustments for serum potassium and intakes of energy, protein, and phosphorus, dietary potassium intake was associated with greater mortality risk. This means that the higher the dietary potassium content, the higher the mortality. The quartile with the highest mortality had an average dietary intake of 3,440 milligrams of potassium per day. This study looked at serum and dialysate potassium concentrations and survival in hemodialysis patients. It was a three-year study of over 81,000 patients on hemodialysis. The study also looked at protein intake. As you can see on this graph, Patients with estimated higher protein intake had higher serum potassium levels. A pre-dialysis serum potassium of 4.6 to 5.3 milliequivalents per liter was associated with the greater survival. The recommended dietary protein intake for dialysis patients is 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day, which in this study was associated with a serum potassium of 5.1 milliequivalents per liter. This can be achieved with a dietary intake of about 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams of potassium per day. A thorough nutrition assessment includes evaluation of potassium status. The assessment should include a review of serum potassium and glucose. The reference range for serum potassium is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Elevated serum glucose may cause potassium to move out of the cells and into the blood circulation. This potassium shift causes hyperkalemia. A review of prescribed and over-the-counter medications is also important when assessing potassium status, since many medications, such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, can cause hyperkalemia. For patients on dialysis, the dialysate potassium concentration should be evaluated. For example, a new dialysis patient on a higher potassium dialysate who starts feeling better and is eating more protein may exhibit higher levels of serum potassium. The dialysate potassium concentration should be adjusted accordingly. A quantitative assessment of dietary potassium intake is also essential. This should include a three-day diet record and a food frequency questionnaire. These methods will reveal intake of high potassium content foods and or supplements. Dietary analysis software can also be used to further quantify dietary potassium intake. Potassium is a mineral found in most foods, so limiting dietary potassium can be a challenge for patients. Patients with chronic kidney disease often have multiple dietary restrictions, such as potassium, sodium, and phosphorus, so they're left with very limited food choices. The typical American diet, which is rich in animal protein and dairy products, provides approximately 3,500 to 4,500 milligrams of potassium per day whereas a potassium-restricted diet is approximately 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams of potassium per day. Clinicians should base the dietary potassium prescription on the serum potassium level. So which foods are high in potassium? Well, foods with more than 200 milligrams of potassium per serving are considered high potassium. Several fruits and vegetables, such as orange, banana, and potato, have a high potassium content. Dairy products, nuts, beans, and chocolate are also potassium-rich foods. Oftentimes, patients on a potassium-restricted diet are also trying to restrict sodium. They may start using a salt substitute or low-sodium spice mix that contains potassium chloride, which causes a spike in their serum potassium. Herbal preparations, such as noni juice and others, may be another problematic source of potassium. In my clinical experience, two of the most common dietary causes of hyperkalemia are related to seasonal foods and cultural or ethnic food preferences. 
In the summer, for example, there are more potassium-rich fruits and vegetables available, such as garden tomatoes or cantaloupe and honeydew melons. Patients are tempted to indulge in seasonal foods that have a high potassium content since their availability is limited year-round. Culturally diverse food preferences are also important considerations for dietary potassium intake. Some cultures eat more fruits and vegetables and dietary staples such as legumes, tubers, plantains, and tomatoes are high in potassium. Patients need intensive education on how to reduce dietary potassium. Portion size is important in reducing dietary potassium since a large serving of a low potassium food can result in a high potassium intake. This is a difficult concept for some patients to understand since they may be eating the right foods but they're just having too much. Food lists can also help patients choose lower potassium content fruits and vegetables. This information can be found on the National Kidney Foundation website at www.kidney.org. I had success with a food list that divided fruits and vegetables into three columns of low, medium, and high potassium choices. I instructed my patients on how many choices they could make from each column. Many of my patients said it was helpful to keep this list on their refrigerator. I also had success showing patients how to occasionally have a small quantity of a high potassium food, which is called sensible cheating. This allows patients to have a favorite food without overdoing it. It's also possible to reduce the potassium content of many fruits and vegetables. For example, peeling fruits such as peaches lowers potassium content since a high concentration of potassium is in the fruit skin. The juice that canned fruits are packed in is also high in potassium since the fruit is cooked in this juice and the potassium leaches out into the liquid. Therefore, patients should drain and rinse canned fruits to reduce potassium content. Leaching is another way to reduce potassium. Leaching is a process of soaking sliced raw vegetables in water for at least two hours before cooking to leach some of the potassium out of the food and into the water. Patients on a sodium restriction should use seasonings that do not contain potassium chloride. Patients should also limit the use of milk and milk products, for example, using milk for cereal or coffee only, or using milk substitute to reduce dietary potassium. And finally, dining out takes careful planning to maintain low to moderate potassium intake. For example, patients can order a half portion of an entree and choose rice instead of potato. So what does treating hypoglycemia have to do with dietary management of hyperkalemia? One of the most common treatments for hypoglycemia is orange juice. But since orange juice is high in potassium, this is contraindicated when restricting dietary potassium. Instead, patients should choose low potassium content beverages and foods that contain 15 grams of carbohydrate. Some examples listed here are lower potassium content juices, such as apple, grape, or cranberry, regular lemonade and clear sodas, regular hard candy, glucose tablets, or glucose gel. These low potassium choices can prevent unwanted spikes in serum potassium while treating hypoglycemia. In conclusion, many potassium rich foods such as fruits and vegetables are also heart healthy. Therefore, a low potassium diet has the potential to fall short of a heart healthy diet and according to several studies may contribute to the burden of cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic kidney disease. It's important to educate patients regarding the different sources of potassium and empower them to make the best choices. A balanced and realistic approach would mean choosing the most beneficial sources of potassium, which is only possible through intensive education by a registered dietitian nutritionist. Thank you for participating in this program.